Keller Labs for helping uh, sponsor this. Uh, we, we certainly use them for a lot of our devices and now even more with their new Clear Dream dorsal design. Uh, the, I really, really like using it. I actually wear it. I uh, wore it last night uh, and myself. I've been wearing it for about a year and it's a great device. And thanks for, for sponsoring. That's a lot to get through, isn't it, Rich? So yeah, it is. So we're, like, you know, we're mostly going to talk about your Medicare options today. You know, when we do that, uh, but we'll also talk about other insurances and things like that. So again, we we want to thank Keller for doing this. Uh, Guy and I both uh, represent Dental Suite Solutions in the DS3 software platform, where we teach uh, dentists how to implement this in their office and do that, and uh, you can see our slide there. We are the most trusted, innovative, customer-focused uh, provider of solutions in dental sleep medicine, and we don't, you know, it's not just a software platform. We do education and implementation, and you guys have a thousand questions about this stuff, and who do you call? You know, Keller is uh, one resource. There are third-party billers that you can call. We'll talk about that today. Uh, but but we uh, certainly want you to get, utilize us as a resource as we get, get into yeah. this. That's what we do. So let's get going. Uh, we do have some hands-on courses. I will put the slide up at the end as well. So uh, one down here in Florida, one up in St. Louis, and then one in San Antonio. So uh, uh, have a pen ready, and we'll put the, that slide up at the end as well, as well as the next webinar that we'll be doing. We have a slide for it. So we're ready to go. We've been using this slide for a long time with the insurance because it's uh, – you know, I don't know if luck is the right word, but uh, it, it really uh, can be. Uh, we used to have a picture of a can of worms, and uh, it can be a can of worms, but we're going to try to unravel it for you today, and thanks for taking your Tuesday evening to, to listen. It's different, isn't it, Rich, what we do now uh, uh, versus uh, dentistry and medicine? Is there a difference between the billing? <laughs> yes, there is. Uh, and you know, we, we for for a long time in dentistry, you know, we we go like this slide because it's you know it's a line in the sand, it's not in the concrete, but but medicine's different, uh, and, and we're going to talk about that today. You know why why it's different and what's different about it, what is so different. You know that that's your next question. So uh, certainly the patient's perspective. You know, and if you can't read that thing with the Pavlov dog, you know, watch what I can make that. Uh, Pavlov do is, is I drool, you know, he, he writes in his little book. So who, who's training who here? So uh, what has happened uh, for the last probably 40 years and, and getting worse every day is patients walk into a medical office and they have a procedure done. And, and many offices across the United States, patients don't pay anything. Their, uh, their medical insurance pays it, and, and the physician does uh, the procedure or something simple for for what the insurance pays. So, uh, again, we, we've not done that in dentistry and, and uh, in, in a good way. We, we've been training our patients that they need to pay us, but, but that's different, and the patient perspective is different. They don't expect to pay anything when, when, they, when you start talking about medicine. And we're, we're going to kind of weave that in and out of, of all of the things that we've talked about today. Right, and the main thing is, is, is when patients come in, uh, they want to know how much it costs, and they want to know that their insurance is covering it or covering a portion of it. Uh, and one of our decisions today is, do you want to to deal with the uh, medical insurance? And we'll go through the pros and cons of of whether we should or shouldn't be doing it. But patients want to know they have medical insurance, and they want to know it's being utilized. And uh, those are the key questions that, if you have answers for, uh, good answers, that uh, you're going to be more successful. Uh, is it is it, you know we put this slide in here to kind of kind of say it's simple to, as a joke uh, uh, you know it's really uh, it, it can be complicated but we're going to try to make it simple for you today. Um, I think I'm going to touch a little bit more on what Rich was talking about with the difference between dental and medical. Um, you, you, you I think as a dentist as training you know hundreds of dentists a year thousands of dentists a year we've we've talked to uh, understanding this difference really will make your life better and you'll understand and feel comfortable with medical billing. It, uh, the, the ethics are even different. When we look at the ADA code of ethics, uh, you can read the slide yourself, but uh, basically we have an obligation, uh, our, the American Dental Association says, to the, uh, the insurance company to, to make sure that they're disclosed of everything that we're doing and, and we're, we're obligated to collect uh, on their behalf. That's what the, the, our ethics dictate. 
And if we pull up the AMA code of ethics, uh, it's, it's actually almost 180 degrees reversed where our commitment is to the well-being of the patient. And if there's a, a barrier of copayment uh, that is keeping a patient from getting a necessary medical treatment, that we should uh, consider waiving that. If we don't, then we're considered unethical. So it's literally almost 180 degree difference uh, in, the, in the ethics. And I think that's one of the reasons as we talk to dentists about uh, medical billing, uh, that there's some preconceived ideas and some um, beliefs that, that maybe aren't valid when we're doing medical billing versus dental billing. Anything you want to add to that, Rich? No, and, and that, uh, like you said, those are different perspectives. You know, when I, I, I use the example, I went in to get some blood drawn the other day, guy, and, you know, what's this going to cost me? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I want to know before you do it. They didn't even know. They, they had no way of knowing. They said there's all these fee schedules and all that. And I said, well, how am I supposed to know how much I'm going to pay? And she goes, well, well, just don't pay it. We don't care. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, holy cow. You know, and the other difference is questions? they don't usually ask you if you want a procedure. They just say, we're going to do this. Uh, right. and so I think, uh, it, and, and, and really when you think about it, medical oftentimes is life and death. And uh, it can be much more serious than dental, and I think that's really why there is a difference in the ethics. So just understand that everything that you've learned up until now for dental is not necessarily going to be parallel uh, with medicine. It's not just about different codes. It's literally about thinking about it uh, differently, and I think that, uh, that that's one of the biggest hurdles for, for, for dentists to, to get over. So hopefully we've, uh, we've um, made that at least a, a thought in your mind and to, and to look at it a little differently. Yeah, and when you think about uh, getting into this, uh, you, you really have to decide if you're going to deal with medical insurance or not. I mean, that, that, that's really the, 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 the point of this slide is uh, uh, simply make a, a decision. Uh, most dentists don't, and we'll talk about that as we go through these slides, but, but if you decide or don't decide, uh, we're here to tell you what that means and what you can expect and uh, the perception that you will portray in the medical community based on your decision. Absolutely. So uh, I think having an informed decision, uh, I, you know, I, I always think it's best to encourage your staff involvement. Um, I, uh, you know, if we dictate things to our, our team, uh, they're not as well received as if they're part of the process. Uh, you know, you've got uh, most teams have uh, some really sharp people working for them, and let's use them and and let's all talk about our options uh, and then decide uh, you know, what we're going to do as an office. I think having a plan is key, though, uh, knowing everyone understanding what your insurance policy is. Uh, not having a policy is, is, is the worst thing. So do we want to do it or not? I, and, and that's a really good question. And if we decide not to deal with medical insurance, right, you're going to have fewer headaches. There's no doubt about it. It's easier for you and your staff. You know, the patient says, how much does it cost? And you just tell them, you know, it's $20. Uh, what's my insurance going to pay? I have no idea. You pay us. You know, file your own medical insurance. Here's the code. Uh, th that's all there is to it. And, and uh, I, I know, Guy, you've kept track of this over time, and, and, and you, you, over months of time, and you, you found out you just didn't do as many cases, right? Over years of time, Rich, I mean, over the last okay. 14 years of doing this, I went from a fee-for-service like my dental practice was to where we started dealing with medical insurance, but basically the patient would pay us all up front at the time of service, like we like to say. Not, we don't like to use the words up front with the patient. Uh, and, uh, and then the check would go to them to reimburse them. Well, uh, that was better than not dealing with it at all. We found about one out of three people would say yes to treatment. Uh, the better we handled insurance, we started get having some of the the money coming to to us and the patient paying a portion. We got over 50 percent or around 50 percent to do that. Now that we really work hard at keeping the out of pocket minimal, and I say minimal, somewhere under a thousand, ideally under 500 dollars to the patient, uh, we we see almost three out of four patients say yes to treatment. And it's not that I've gotten that much better at convincing patients to do treatment. We've just gotten better at having a system to minimize the out-of-pocket expense for the patient, and uh, we're going to do more. So is it worth it? Uh, you know, if you don't deal with it, there you see see uh, the, the, there's less headaches, uh, but you are, I don't care who you are, I promise you, you're going to have less case acceptance and patients have to pay more money. It's just why, why do you, Why do we have 
uh, fewer referrals in there too as well. What? Yeah, what and, and you know, Rich, if you put that slide in there and you put fewer, and if you'll notice, I put no referrals. Right. <laughs> okay, I put the no after. I don't know if you noticed the subtle change there. Uh, I, I can tell you, if you want to build a referral-based dental sleep practice, and you go and you go to your physician and you meet with them and you say, I'm ready for you to send the people over. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm skilled at this. You've learned all your education, and you're maybe the the best dental sleep dentist in the, in the country. Uh, the first question they're going to ask you is, how much does it cost my patients? Do you take medical insurance? Something along that line. Do you, do you, do you, and if you tell them no, uh, they're, they won't send you patients. Uh, or they'll send you a few, and then the patients go back and tell them, what well, was going to cost me $2,000 out of pocket or what have you. And they will just quit sending them off uh, to you. So I changed that to put no, because I don't believe you can get a good medically referred uh, dental sleep practice, if that's what you're striving for, uh, without dealing with medical insurance. I, I think it just shuts off the valve of the flow of patients um, from, from the medical office. I think you agree okay. completely with that, don't you? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And, and it's, it's, it's fewer or no, depending on the person, probably more like no. But And this is what you were saying earlier. You know, you can be the greatest salesman in the world, but uh, uh, MDs, simply don't understand why we as dentists can't do a procedure that we spend a couple of hours on and make a couple hundred dollars. They don't understand why we won't do that uh, all day, every day. Well, they, they don't have the cost that we have associated with an office and the equipment. Guy, you were talking about that the other day. You know, you put a dental office together and you, you right. pay 300 grand, 400 grand, to buy all the equipment, and you think you own it. You know, it takes you ten years to pay it off, and by the time you pay it off, you got to replace it again. Right. Uh, it's you know, uh, it's worn off. out. Right. Yeah, and they just they don't have that, and they don't understand that. But see, so we just want you to know, okay, that when you make these decisions, uh, there are repercussions from that. You you can do whatever you want to do. We want to encourage you to do dental sleep medicine. We just want you to make informed decisions. So if you do deal with it, uh, you're going to have more headaches. There's no doubt about it. You you you, you have to uh, have a, some way to verify uh, insurance benefits, and you have to figure out what deductibles are and they aren't, and how do you fill the claim out, and what does it mean if I accept the assignment or I don't accept the assignment. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. But in the end, you do get more referrals, uh, you do more cases, and you do save more lives. Absolutely, and I think the last one's important. I mean, if that's we're really trying to help these people. Um, if you don't handle the medical insurance, you're going to treat less people, and, and literally that is the, the, the end result. Uh, so uh, you got to think about these things carefully. Um, that's what you think most offices is, are, fall into this category now, Rich? They just don't oh, deal absolutely. with Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, mean I, I think, I really think, Guy, this is why, th this is the single biggest reason why dental sleep medicine uh, only has 3 to 4% of the market share. It is because dentists don't deal with 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 sleep, uh, right. they, they, with insurance. You know, they they just don't. So that the doctor makes a referral and the patient comes back and goes, "Oh, my insurance didn't cover it." And, and so most of the physicians out there think that dental devices aren't covered because right. that's what all the patients who come back tell them. Uh, so the status quo, very simply, is most dentists don't do this. Uh, if you want to differentiate yourself then we think you should do it, and uh, let's talk about how to do that. Right, and again, you can see it's uh, the more you do, I think we've hammered that pretty pretty much home, but I think you at least have to accept some of the payment from the insurance company, uh, help them get re some reimbursement, or ideally the checks come to you, and we'll talk about the difference between accepting assignment of benefit and uh, and not here, here directly. So. All right. And that's, that's your involvement. You, you have no involvement and you don't deal with it. Uh, you'll do fewer cases, but you'll have fewer headaches, and, right. and you get the patient to pay you. If you do get involved with it, then uh, now most of what we're going to talk about is how to get involved in, in it. What, what does it mean to accept assignments of benefits? And let's, let's kind of go through some of these guys. We look at them and talk about them. Right, and I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. Uh, I think uh, you know we, we, some of you have seen some of our webinars in the past. But what I want to emphasize from this is you need to decide as an office what fee amount that you need 
to make this a profitable service in your office. I mean, that's what we should do for all our fees. And you can back into kind of what you make doing a crown versus uh, doing a, uh, uh, a dental uh, device uh, by just basically reversing the, the, the formula, the amount of time you spend. But what you decide you need to make you happy to do this and to be profitable, because we are in the, uh, a business, may not necessarily be exactly reflective of how you build this. There's different ways of getting that fee. So we're talking about two different things here. One is how much you need to make you happy to do this, and then there's various ways of structuring billing uh, that we're going to talk about now. So the first step is, is, is really understanding what your practice needs to make you do that. So come up with a system to do that. And then we've got a couple other big decisions to make. What are we going to do with Medicare? And then how are we going to handle other medical insurance? And, and you really do have to just separate these out because they're handled uh, they actually have different rules and guidelines, and, uh, and, and they're, 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 they're uh, pretty different. So uh, we're going to spend uh, a fair amount of time on the Medicare uh, this morning. So Yeah, it's that uh, picture you took down in the Keys the other day, right, Guy? That's a, <laughs> yeah. Isn't that a cool picture? Uh, that is a great picture, uh, absolutely. Well, let's, let's try to get a clear picture of Medicare. You know, when we, we look at this and we think about it, in 2008, uh, Medicare came out with a code E, as in Edgar 0486. Uh, initially, we couldn't get uh, uh, the local uh, chapters of Medicare. Remember, there's four jurisdictions of Medicare, depending on which part of the country you live in. And, and it was kind of sporadic at first, but you know, the what they call LCDs or local coverage determinations started coming out, and and now uh, Medicare pays for these things. Uh, they allow. Uh, anywhere from $1,200 to $2,500, and, and they reimburse 80% of that amount depending on which region you're in. Uh, you do have to use a Medicare-approved device. Uh, you can go to uh, Medicare's uh, uh, website to get those. I don't know if we have those in there or not tonight, but they're basically TAP-3 uh, Elite uh, and the herbs. devices. And uh, I think a couple of the Suwads now are, are as well. And there's right. a couple of other ones on there that aren't as popular. But, yeah. but again, yeah, Medicare is paying for these things. Uh, the reimbursement varies by your region, and you do have to use a Medicare device. And uh, one of the questions that someone's typed in, and, uh, and we will get to all your questions, so I appreciate you typing in, is you cannot bill the secondary insurance. And if their Medicare is their primary, so you have, and most of the cases that's what it is. Medic people who have Medicare, most of the time that is their primary insurance. So their secondary and their other insurance won't cover it unless you bill Medicare first. So you have to be a Medicare provider, uh, and, and before you can tap into the secondary insurance. So we'll move on here. So first big decision: Are you going to opt out? Or are you going to be participating in Medicare? Uh, and uh, it's a decision that you're really supposed to do. Well, if you're a dentist uh, and you uh, don't do uh, advanced oral surgery, uh, then most likely you're not doing any procedures in your office right now if you're not already doing dental sleep uh, that are, uh, are Medicare, um, that Medicare has a, a code for that are Medicare um, but you can services bill for and get paid you can bill for. Right. So you haven't had to make a decision on this previously. The moment you start doing mandibular advancement devices for apneic patients, uh, now you're providing a service in your office that is billable to Medicare, and you are supposed to decide uh, whether you're going to be a Medicare uh, provider to participate in that or to opt out. And we'll talk about each of the uh, uh, of these choices and and what you want to do. Sorry, I went too far there. Um, anything you want to say about this, Rich? Well, again, it's that same old stuff about how did the MDs perceive you. A, a guy, you, you practice in Florida. You have more older people in Florida, right? I mean, yes, sir. At least half the year, right? Yes. Uh, when, it, when it's cold in the north anyway, right? So, you know, how, how what you choose to do may be completely different than somebody who lives in a very uh, younger town who doesn't have old people. But, again, what, what percent of the patient population is coming through your door that you do this? And, and, and I think especially the MDs uh, really do look at this. This goes back to the referral or no referrals and how you do this. And, and like I said as well, you can't tap into the secondary insurance un unless uh, you choose uh, to be a part of Medicare. So you, you choose to participate or not participate, and if you don't participate, you simply opt out. Okay? It, it's, uh, you get the contract off the Medicare website, 
Uh, you print it out. It's only three or four pages. And uh, you uh, sign it along with the affidavit. Uh, you get it to them, and it lasts for two years. And, and what that basically means is you can't bill Medicare for any service that you provide for a Medicare patient when you opt out. Nor can the patient submit a bill themselves for what you do. So we talk about this advanced beneficiary notice, and that is designed to protect a Medicare patient. When If you have opted out from Medicare, when you go in and you're going to make them a mandibular repositioning device, you need to get them to sign that advanced beneficiary notice so that they understand and know beyond any shadow of a doubt that you are not going to bill Medicare, nor can they. You are operating outside the bounds of Medicare. Right. And this is how we simply don't get involved with Medicare. We opt out. Right. And uh, one thing I want to mention is if you opt out, uh, it lasts for two years, and you can't change your mind in, in that two years either. So you can't opt in. You can't say, oh, I've changed my mind. So it's two years, period, uh, you've opted out. No opt-in back in. And at the end of two years, you can change your mind at that point. I think you said everything else that was on there. Uh, the anything else on that, Rich? Before I hit the show, no, kind of what I put that, Yeah, I'm glad you glad you put that in. And, you know, when we look at this advanced beneficiary notice, uh, that's something you guys just did the other day in your office. Yeah, you know, we did. You got and, that slide guy. Yeah, and, and if you have questions about this or anything else, again, we're going to give you our contact information at the end of the uh, webinar. Feel free to contact our team. That's what they do. Uh, I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes explaining this form. Uh, we just don't have time for it. But but essentially, the, the top part in pink is filled out by uh, the, the dental office. Uh, and then the bottom part is filled out by the patient. And there's three options, uh, which we can, uh, can, can, can go over with you. But basically, option one is, is if they opt out. Option two, we have our patients fill out, even if we are Medicare providers, because that way, if, if part of the fees aren't covered by Medicare, then then it allows us to have some rights to bill them more. And then they, they select option three if they say, hey, I don't want a mandibular advance device. Again, uh, that's kind of the, a, a quick run over, over the advanced beneficiary notice. So opting out is uh, you know pretty straightforward. You opt out. You use the ABN on all the patients that come in. You have them sign that. And you go about your business and charge your patients an appropriate fee, and they pay you directly. Uh, to participate in Medicare is a little bit more complicated. Um, first of all, we want to mention there are different parts of Medicare, and we're going to talk today just about the DME because that's what uh, dental devices fall under. DME stands for Durable Medical Equipment. So you know, all of them. You know what I figured out today too, guy? What's that? They, they, depending on how far they go in the alphabet, right? A, B, C, D, DME, E, F, G, H. By the time you get to N. It means not much coverage. <laughs> that's but, a that's a but new there one. are a bunch of parts. There are a bunch of parts to this. Right, we and really we're only going to be talking about dentistry. the DME today because that is uh, what dental devices uh, fall under. So, uh, to participate uh, for DME, uh, it's the form. This is 855S. Is that right, Rich? Uh, that's the form. That's what they have to the application. Yes, and, and you get that through the PECO system. Uh, I think we have a we have a slide in there. Yeah, but, uh, but the DME part of that is the 855S. Uh, it's only about 70 pages. You download that form, or you can do it online. And uh, now you are a DME provider for Medicare. That's what that means when, when you when you do that. So you, again, you opt out or you become a provider, and that's how you become a provider for DME, is you have to fill out the 855S. Right, and we'll, we have a link coming up in a minute, and again, uh, if you don't have time to write it down, we're, we're happy to get it to you. Uh, it does take some time. I mean, uh, about a month is about as quick as I've ever heard anybody getting their number. Uh, I've heard other offices have taken six months or longer. So uh, just making the decision, it isn't like the next day you're going to have this number in your hand. So. Uh, uh, making the decision as quick as you can, and then if you're going to become a Medicare provider, then uh, getting on it quicker than later uh, will will get you further down the road, and it does take a little bit of time. When we treat Medicare patients, if we become a Medicare provider, then uh, certain uh, guidelines uh, we're subject to. 
Uh, typically, we need a prescription, and uh, LOMN is a letter of medical necessity from uh, uh, typically the primary care physician. Sometimes it can be from their sleep physician. Uh, we certainly need a sleep study on file, uh, including a face-to-face -face with the MD they have to, that, that ordered that sleep study. Uh, typically, and we need to have clinical notes on fire, uh, file. And as Rich mentioned, we have to use uh, one of the Medicare-approved devices, which in our my uh, office is, is either the TAP3 or the HERPS. Uh, uh, there's a couple of other ones uh, that, 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 that I don't use regularly. Uh, and we still recommend, even if you're a Medicare provider, that you check that second box, or the patient does, of the ABN, uh, because that way if uh, we some of the fees aren't covered by Medicare, uh, it gives us a little bit more leeway to 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 um, to uh, ask for those fees. Uh, this slide uh, we're happy to send to you as well. That's the actual wording from uh, Medicare as far as who qualifies and who doesn't and and, and what we need to do. Uh, to break that down more simply, though, uh, I think this slide. Do you want to explain this, Rich? Uh, what, 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 yeah. What they need? Remember that Medicare is a different beast than, than other insurance, okay? So Medicare requires that that patient have a face-to-face -face with a physician, okay? There are a few services out there now that will do this through video conferencing. Uh, I think in the future we'll certainly see more of that, but for now, assume that that patient has to see their primary care doc or the sleep doc. And then if they have mild, moderate, or severe disease, they may have an HI of 5, apnea hypopnea index of 5.1. That means they have mild sleep apnea. But they may have only slept for an hour and 40 minutes, so they didn't have even 10 events to do that. So again, Medicare has guidelines for these types of things. And if, if you have a patient who has mild sleep apnea and they've not had a face-to-face, you don't have the prescription from the MD, and you can't document that they have 10 events or more along with comorbidity, then you're not going to get paid for it. it. It's just that simple, okay? So there you see it. That, that slide before was very uh, complicated. We have, you know, we, we've researched this and looked at it and done it and experienced it, and, and very simply, face-to-face uh, yeah, -face with the doctor, if they have mild or moderate, uh, there are uh, minimums that they have to have as far as number of events and comorbidities, and if they have uh, severe, they have to fill out that uh, CPAP affidavit for intolerance, so they have to have tried PAP first, and, and then, of course, you must perform and uh, bill as the dentist, the dental device. Very good. Um, and, uh, you know, on occasion, patients say they don't want to try CPAP. Uh, what do you do in that case, Rich? Do you, do you say, well, the Medicare may not cover it or won't cover it if, unless you try it first? Or um, Typically, they do try it during the CPAP titration, and I found that that's good enough. If they had it on during that CPAP titration, they have, in fact, tried uh, CPAP, and so uh, uh, that, that will be covered as, a, as, a, as intolerant uh, to, to CPAP. So, all right. I agree. Very good point. All right, so uh, assignment of benefits, what does this mean uh, when it comes to Medicare? Yeah, and, and this, you know, let, let's go to, you know, this is this part of a CMS 1500 claim form, and, and if we zoom in a little bit more to that box number 27, you know, very simply, uh, do you accept assignment, yes or no? And, and basically what that means is uh, when you accept that, then then you are are participating in that, and when you don't, uh, you, you you're you're not. I mean, there's there's different ways to say that and do it, but uh, it, it it's an important distinction uh, which box you check when you do that. So again, we've assumed that you've not opted out. We assume that you filled out the 855s. You are now a DME provider with Medicare. You are going to uh, work with a Medicare patient, and when you go to fill this form out, which box you check does make a difference? It makes a huge difference. And uh, one thing we're going to uh, mention is, you know, at the end of this, you may consider, or actually, we'll we will say that we advise as you get involved to, to use a third-party biller. We have some really good partners that we work with, which we're happy to uh, to uh, to put you in their direction if you want to contact our office. Uh, uh, tomorrow or, or, or sometime in the future, uh, you, you also will need to let them know on each case or as a generality what 
which direction to go here. And it does make a big difference, which we're going to talk about right now. So if we, we call this participating because that's the, the verbiage we used to use, but essentially it's really, uh, it means that we are accepting assignment of benefits. Uh, that's the same thing that we can we can call it there. And uh, the reason we use the word participating, it seems to be the terminology a lot of a lot of other uh, uh, insurance uh, billers and so forth uh, call this. But essentially, the check is going to come to you, right? Uh, and the, the secondary. It, it might not be a big check, but it is right. going to come to you. Right. So again, let me back up again. So you're going to click yes here, right, on this on this, uh, or have your insurance biller. Say, yes, I'm going to uh, accept Medicare. And what you're essentially saying is I accept the Medicare fee uh, in, as payment in full for this particular uh, patient, uh, for this particular case. And you're going to get the Medicare allowable amount uh, for that particular you're gonna patient. Get a you're going to get 80% of the uh, right. Medicare allowable amount. Right. Correct. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. Medicare pays the 80 percent, and then the patient pays the 20 percent. Or oftentimes they have secondary insurance, which which covers it. But I think the key thing here is you cannot balance bill uh, the patient. You, you mean you mean you can't balance bill the patient or their secondary insurance? No. Well, the secondary insurance right. is going to do the 20 percent, but no, you can't ask for more money than the Medicare allowable amount for your period uh, for your region. Correct. Which is typically uh, you see the range we have uh, is 850 to 1500. Uh, again, if you need to know what your region is, uh, we can let you know that as well. But uh, you know, and, and again, this is on each case. You can change from one to another, which we we used to not uh, realize that we could do, or we weren't. Um, most people weren't doing it that way. Uh, I think it's uh, it's good to kind of have a policy and try to stick with one direction or another. But in this case, if we if we uh, participate, uh, I think that the next slide uh, shows us a little bit more. Uh, we, we get the checks that comes to us, and we have to take that amount. So if we back up and we say we don't want to accept the assignment of bill, uh, benefits on that box 27, then we call that non-participating. Uh, we're not accepting an assignment of billing uh, of benefits for that particular patient. Now, the, the, the key difference here is the checks are going to go to the patient. So whatever uh, amount, Medicare, uh, they're 80%. Of the allowable amount will go to them, and then our secondary insurance check will also go to the patient, and uh, we can balance bill the patient, and I think that's the key difference. So uh, uh, the the secondary insurance check typically is usually just the allowable amount, the the 20 percent, but sometimes they actually pay pay more as well. So uh, you know what to do. It really depends on on the on the patient and trying to keep the out of pocket and and, and what you feel comfortable with. Um, Anything else that I didn't say on that, Rich, you want to add? No, that was good. I, I just remember we go back to that little box, you know, and here's kind of the summary. If you check yes on that accept assignments of benefits box, you are accepting the fact that you, you, you're going to get what Medicare pays. That's it. So you can, you, the patient will pay the 20% or the patient's secondary insurance can pick up the 20%. So it may not cost the patient anything if they have a secondary insurance. But again, the allowable in my jurisdiction in Texas is only $1,250, give or take a few. So we, we get paid $824 uh, from Medicare if we check that box. We charge the patient the, 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 the difference, okay, for what Medicare allows. Now you cannot charge the patient the difference if you check that box in what you want to charge. The only way you can do that is if you check no on that box. So you do not accept uh, assignment of benefits. Now, if you want to charge $2,000 and Medicare only allows $1,200, Medicare will pay the 80% of what they allow, and you can balance bill the patient the other $1,200 difference. That's right. the biggest thing. Absolutely, and the one thing, the 5% what that is, is Medicare allows 5% more if you accept a sign of, of benefits still uh, versus not. So that, that's what, where that comes comes into play uh, it, uh, uh, as far as the uh, the total amount of the allowable amount. What do you, what do, you do with that extra 25 bucks, right? <laughs> yeah, and I don't think it's quite 1,200 rich in your region. I think it's, it's, it's closer to just a, a little less than 1,100, but... Regardless, you're right. It's 824 is the amount that the uh, uh, is what Medicare pays because I'm in the same region as you are. 
Uh, and so you have to make a decision. And you know, and what uh, we're going to talk about what our recommendations are in a minute. But um, you know, you can you can do do one for one patient and one for another as well. Uh, the only thing is, again, if you that's if you deal with Medicare, if you decide to opt out, there again, then that's a two-year uh, contract, and uh, it, no one can bill Medicare uh, yourself or the patient. So I hope we've made that. As clear as we can, it is kind of confusing, um, but I think that the, uh, if you just walk down those decisions, decide if you want to be involved in Medicare or not, and then if so, uh, the assignment of benefits is the next uh, uh, decision. If you're going to be involved I, in Medicare, I, go ahead. I think you did a great job with that. <laughs> I mean, it, it only took me 13 years to figure that out. You know, and, uh, Right. When you think about when we started doing this, nobody even knew these things, and you you could not uh, you couldn't call anybody, you couldn't sign up for a webinar, you couldn't get any of this information. So right. again, you guys are going to have a lot of questions, and we'll give you our contact information. We want to do that. Re re remember also that, that these devices need to last five years. You know, with Medicare, it's a global fee, so you can't bill for anything else during this time. Okay, and. Uh, we don't want to get into the Part B. That will complicate things a little bit. But uh, you can bill for office visits, but that requires a completely different application and things like that. And uh, even Guy and I in our offices where we're doing 25, uh, 30 devices a month, we, we, we typically don't even participate in that because it's not worth it. Uh, right. So the bottom but, line is involve your team, uh, discuss your options, and, and having a plan is key. I mean, I would rather see people opt out, not deal with insurance, than to not know what to say when the patient asks them. Uh, you've got to have a plan. Uh, if you're going to be a, uh, a Medicare provider, then get someone who's good with um, uh, um, what's good with details and filling these, uh, and, and someone who maybe is good with follow through, because uh, and get one of your staff members to be in charge of that, uh, because it does take a little bit of time, uh, and it's one of those the things uh, that uh, squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing, the more often uh, that they're contacting Medicare, where's my application, what's going on with it, the, the quicker you can get this done. So what do we recommend? We, Rich and I are both Medicare providers, uh, and we think if you're going to do dental sleep in your practice, uh, that it is really a more of a it's really kind of an injustice to your patients not to tap into this money that's sitting there for them. If you have Medicare patients, uh, you know, I guess if you lived in an area where you have no Medicare patients, then it might make sense not to uh, to be involved. Uh, in Florida here, half my patients are Medicare. If even 20% of your patients are Medicare, you're just leaving uh, money that decreases the cost for the patient. Uh, basically on the table, and it's uh, it's really not a, the greatest service for your patients. You should try to uh, help tap into that. So we, we would recommend in general uh, to become a Medicare provider. And then in each individual case, uh, most of the time, I do not accept the assignment of benefits. So in other words, the check goes to the patient, and we can balance bill. Uh, but I have what a What about occasionally, Guy? I know you're such a nice guy. You have a little right. old lady that just you endear your heart to her, and... Uh, you you want to do this uh, for what Medicare allows. This, Absolutely. This gives you the latitude to pick that box, right? And I do that for exactly for that reason. Someone who has pretty severe apnea, I'm really truly concerned about this lady. Uh, I, I feel like I'm doing the right thing by doing that, and we go ahead and do it. Also, if it's a new referral source or a good referral source, uh, sometimes we do that to, to, to keep the, again, if the, if the patient goes back and says, I couldn't afford it too many times to the referral source, uh, they're going to quit referring patients. So those are a couple of good reasons to accept assignment of benefits uh, if we have to. And, and again, we have the option to do it. So 90% of the time we don't. Uh, today, as a matter of fact, I told you know a, a patient we would accept assignment of benefits because I really felt they needed the device. They really felt they couldn't uh, cover any additional costs. So we we you know we we went ahead and did it an assignment. And you can you can choose individually. Make sure you know what that means when you choose those boxes or when you instruct your third-party billers to do so. Uh, all right, I think that made that pretty clear. Here's the contact information on that, where you get the 855S form. And I'll leave it up for just a second. Anything else on Medicare before we move on to private insurance, Rich? No, that was, that was good. That went faster than I, I thought it would, you know. But uh, I, I think maybe that's a testament that uh, you and I both understand this a little better. <laughs> Absolutely. So. 
Yeah. So again, yeah. if, if you just you Google CMS.gov uh, Medicare uh, Pecos 855S, that will get you. Uh, I love this uh, online thing. That's what I did it through. Uh, you download the form. Uh, you, you fill it out. It takes forever to do, you know, and that kind of thing. You get it to it. If you do it online. You can actually mouse over some of the things and, and, you know, what does it mean if I choose this or that, that kind of thing. And, again, uh, call us. We can help you do this. Uh, there are services out there that do this. We do this for uh, uh, dentists, uh, some of the third-party billers that we uh, uh, call our preferred partners that we work with a lot with, uh, which we're happy to share that with you if you do call us. Uh, they do this as well. So, again, an attention to detail oriented staff person is perfect for this, uh, but you can also pay somebody else to do it. Is there any questions on Medicare that are rich in the question box? I haven't been. Uh, uh, there are a couple, you know, the uh, 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 sleep studies need to be done within the last three months. No, I, w I would say, Guy, we've even seen them out, what, four or five years occasionally, yeah. and they still work. Uh, again, it comes back to that face-to-face -face where the, the patient has seen the physician, and if the physician says, no, I don't really think you need a sleep study, uh, you had sleep apnea back then, you know, you're older now, you put on a little weight, I'm sure it's probably worse, but we, we do need that prescription and that. So I think anything more than a couple of years, you might consider trying to get a new sleep study. Right. Uh, the, the diagnosis code that will come back from the physician is 327. Uh, 327.23. Did I say that right? I think so. I think that's, I think that's it. Yeah, 327.23. I guess I mean numbers going around in my head at the moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, 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 again, we try to give you your options for Medicare. You opt out or you become a provider. And then once right. you become a provider on a case by case, that box number 27, you accept assignment, that's it. You know, you can't really bill for anything else. You, you don't accept assignment, then you can't bill and you get access to uh, your your full fee that way. I think that's good. All right, great. Well, we'll move on to uh, private insurance, and so we'll be finished on time and with some time for questions, and we'll see if there's any additional questions uh, at the end that we'll make sure we, we stay on long enough to get to all of them. Uh, medical insurance, uh, you, you know, this uh, insurance in general is all about making decisions and systems. Uh, the first decision we need to make, are we going to be uh, in network or out of network? Uh, and uh, I should mention before I get into in network, uh, different than uh, uh, Medicare, uh, you are out of network by default. Uh, Medicare, again, requires action. You're supposed to opt out or participate. With private insurance, if you don't become in network, which takes uh, uh, you as an office, as a, as a dentist, filling out a, a, a contract with the insurance company, then you are out of network by default. So it's a little different. Uh, what's the advantages to in-network? Um, and uh, Make sure everybody understands what we mean by in-network. That means we have a contract now with the, den the, with the medical uh, insurance company that we have agreed to provide uh, mandibular advancement devices for patients for a usually a, a set fee or some set of fees. Uh, so we've agreed to that and we have, uh, when we do this, it's kind of a lengthy process at times. Uh, uh, part of that process might be negotiating the fee that you're comfortable with. Uh, we can't always become in network. Some, some companies don't accept us uh, as dentists in their medical uh, insurance uh, as, as in network. Uh, and I think what we mean by regionally specific here is certain uh, areas, like in Florida, a, a lot of my patients have out-of-network benefits. So in other words, uh, they can go in-network or out-of-network. Some insurances, medical insurance companies, don't have, so the patients won't have out-of-network benefits. So if they come to you and you're not in-network, then they may not be able to get any coverage for their dental device. And I think one of the key things to being in-network is you have a written contract with these with this medical insurance company, and so you are obligated to collect copays, to uh, do what you say you're going to do, and to not do that is a is, is a you know you're you're breaching your agreement with them. Uh, so that's one of the key differences. It is much easier uh, if you have a, a contract and you know and Rich. Uh, uh, in a moment, you can speak. I know you're in network with a couple of the companies. It's it, it's easier, right? Do you know how much they're going to cover and how much it is? Uh, the math's easier, correct? 
Uh, that's what they tell me. Okay. You know, so I mean, yeah, you, it is. You, it is a little easier. You've got an agreed amount. You know the copays. Uh, you know when you're out of network, you don't always know, or you usually don't know, I should say, how much the company will allow for a certain device. So it makes the math you know, it, it kind of that 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 I don't know, kind of like the answer you got when you went to the to the doctor the other day. Uh, typically, patients will have a less of an in-network deductible, a smaller amount. So maybe a $500 deductible versus a thousand or fifteen hundred for out of network. And what sometimes we we talk about if you're going to refer to a a PSG or a home sleep test that maybe if you're in network then you would ideally want the, 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 the sleep testing company to do the same billing because that way we're working on the same deductible but I think it's we, we see we have that down on the list because uh, uh, you know it's it's not the, the absolute most important thing anything on in network that I missed Rich you want to mention no I think that's pretty good I, I I do just because you're in network with Aetna's dental, for example, does not mean you're in network with Aetna's medical. For you know, so don't assume that you're in network with any medical. Medical. Uh, if you assume anything, assume that you are not, because it's very unlikely that that you are if you've not done that. Uh, the lengthy process, you know, I I think uh, some of the applications were 50, 60, 70 pages. Uh, you just get your information together and you do this, and uh, it, it does make it a little bit easier. Uh, the biggest uh, thing with this is very simply is negotiating a fee. <clears throat> I negotiated with a fee with Aetna 10 years ago, you know, more than a decade ago, and they have not raised that fee one dollar. So uh, we call them uh, about every six months and we say, hey, we're going to quit if you don't raise the fee, and they say, fine, quit. Uh, so. Uh, you know, for better or worse, but at least we know what they allow. We right. know what they're going to pay because patients want to know how much does it cost, what will my insurance pay. Right. And, and if they have out-of-network benefits, their deductible is usually higher, right, than in-network. But, but uh, you, you may live in a town where 40% of, of the people have the same insurance plan. Right? right, you live in town that has forty, fifty thousand people, and, and there's one large employer, which a lot of times is a school district or something like that. Uh, you may want to do that. You may want to become in network because it, it will make that process much easier. If if you live in a big city, I live in a city with two million people. There's so many different insurance plans and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> uh, but right. you you have to make an eligible decision. And that's where uh, some of the uh, insurance billing companies, the third-party billers, some of our partners can help you because they've done this throughout the country, and they may have a, a better idea of your particular region or something, what, what might be best. So they can help you with those decisions as well. So if you're not uh, in network, then you're out of network. And again, this is by default. Uh, you know, the, the advantages to being out of network, um, you know, you, you're not – in a contract with the uh, you haven't signed a contract with the uh, insurance company so uh, you know you don't you're, you don't have to you're not abiding by something that you've agreed to and in most states that allows you to be a little more flexible as far as a, a hardship if we go back to the ethics uh, slide of uh, at the beginning of the uh, of, uh, presentation if someone truly can't afford something and uh, we find out later on that the insurance company didn't cover as much or, or something that, that we thought it would, then uh, in most states there are, there are ways to, to, uh, to not collect uh, certain amounts of the balanced bill that we, that we, that we normally would uh, when there's a, a, a financial hardship of some sort. So, and you can legally do that in most states uh, because you, haven't, you don't have a contract. Um, I think the biggest thing about this is that it requires more diligence in sy systems. Uh, it's sometimes unclear, most times it's unclear, that the, the uh, insurance company will not tell you the allowable amount. So you know what you bill, but you don't know if they're going to allow that amount. And so it's hard to give an exact dollar amount to the patient as to what their responsibility is going to be because of the unknown of what the insurance company will allow, and they just won't tell you when you call them up, so you don't know until you, you get You mean they won't the, tell you? No, they will not tell you, and it makes sense if you think about it. They don't want us calling up and saying what's your allowable amount and then billing you, one. You allow 4000 Yeah, oh, gosh, I was only going to bill you three. Let's, 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 let's make it four now. So, 
you know, they're, they're, they're smart that way, uh, so uh, it, it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, you know what you can do, though, in some cases, uh, and we do this quite often, although it's getting harder and harder to do, if a patient doesn't have out-of-network benefits uh, and there aren't any providers in your area, uh, so other dentists doing this who are in network, then sometimes you can become in network on a per case basis by doing what we call gap coverage. It's kind of a lengthy process and again uh, it's something that third party builders are quite accustomed to doing. Uh, if we're going to be out of network then there are some advantages to using a, a sleep testing facility that, that, that also is out of network. Anything else on that Rich that uh, that I didn't hit? No, I I, th I think you're good. I, if we, I will tell you that the trend that we seem to be seeing is that more and more uh, insurance uh, providers are not allowing out-of-network benefits. Yes. Uh, we, we used to routinely get gap uh, exceptions for this. So you're in a PPO and you 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 don't have a provider that 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 payer does not have a provider who who does the service. If you have a gap in your coverage, you can go out of network and do that. So uh, again, uh, insurances are, are are getting more restrictive because. Uh, uh, I promise, Guy, I wouldn't talk about Obamacare or anything, but, but uh, you know, but because of things that are going on, we're all paying more for insurance for less benefits. I mean, and, and that, that's the end result. And, and, and think about that when you do that. You know, just, just get with your staff. They, they all can bring quite a bit uh, to the table about what kinds of insurances the patients have and what you deal with, and, and if you make a decision – to deal with Medicare or not, or in network or out of network, you know all of those things. Knowledge is power, and how you do that. But you got to have a system, right, guy? Right, and I think that's the key. And if you're going to do out of network, then it becomes uh, what kind of out of network system? There's fee for service. You can have the checks come to you. You can assign a, a, a separate assignment of benefits, or not as well. So there's some other decisions and. There's uh, various ways of billing uh, fixed amounts, more flexible systems. And then do you want to bill just the one code, E0486, which is the safest and your best bet by far? Uh, because we know that we're allowed to bill for that. Uh, we're, the other codes that I'm going to flash on the screen, some people do bill for these appointments as well. Uh, but you're uh, beholden to a lot higher uh, standard as far as your records go if you do uh, the other codes. Uh, and uh, I do know of at least a couple of cases where insurance companies have come back and said, hey, we only pay for the E0486 and we want some of our money back that we paid you for billing these other codes. So if you want to be safe, uh, E0486 is, you know, do just like you do with Medicare, a global fee. Um, if you feel comfortable and after researching things you feel that it's appropriate to bill one of these other codes, uh, then uh, uh, some of our offices do do, do that. Uh, and there's some other uh, some other codes that you can use for your ear check and stuff that that we're not recommending that you necessarily use those, but be aware that uh, that, that that some people do do bill for those codes. So I think we're getting close to to finished here. Um, developing a policy that's the main key, don't you agree, Rich? And having a plan. Here's your decisions. Yeah, the only thing I, I might add to what you said before about that, though, is uh, that the coding for medi medical issues is very descriptive. In other words, if, if you do a consultation and you want to do a level four, for example, you have to spend a certain amount of time with the patient, and you have to look at a certain number <coughs> of, of, of systems and things like that. So, again, you, you said it, Guy, but I, I just want to drive it home again. Uh, you know, make sure you do a little bit of research. And again, this this is why we love to work with third-party builders when we do that. But uh, develop a plan, figure out what you're going to do, uh, get your staff involved as you make a decision. It does make a very big difference whether or not you check that box. You know, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know as far as accepting assignment of benefits or not. Uh, look at your uh, Medicare patient population uh, as you decide how you're going to do that. Consider how uh, that decision is going to affect your uh, sleep uh, referral sources. You know, as you do that, uh, as you look at other insurance uh, as well, uh, evaluate in or out of network. And, uh, 
knowledge is power. You know, the more information you have about this and you do that, there's so much more information out there now. I mean, I mean, seriously, uh, we want to give ourselves a pat on the back occasionally, but the amount of information you have gotten here tonight in this webinar is more than, uh, what would you say, Guy, you and I got the first seven or eight years uh, that, that was even available out there. It was. It was even. It wasn't even available. We had, uh, and so you, you've got a. Uh, it's a perfect time for dental sleep because a lot of things are, are have been and are continuing to be figured out on your behalf, and it's easier for dentists. And even up to my last point here, I know we've mentioned that uh, using a third-party biller insurance company is a is a is a great thing. Well, these companies weren't available. Uh, ten years ago, you know, so now you can just turn this over to someone else and look we don't I know it sounds like we're uh, promoting that but I think we are because we want you to be successful at this and we're not getting uh, referrals or, or, or uh, any anything out of uh, referring to the third-party billers other than knowing that you're uh, going to more likely do dental sleep if we take away one of the big hurdles which is billing and until you feel comfortable doing it yourself or certainly uh, uh, good, good companies out there now that can can help you with with this because it, it if it's not handled appropriately, it will crash the dental sleep medicine train, and we'll come to a screeching halt. <laughs> you know, and we we want to see you we want to see you succeed with it. So uh, it, it's it's much easier than it was. So uh, I think we're going to be finished in time for some questions here. Again, I told you I'd give you the dates. Here's the dates. Come on down to sunny Florida. Here in Bradenton, hopefully it'll be nice uh, in January. It usually is. It's at the Yacht Club here in Bradenton, two-day course. All these courses are two-day courses. You get a home sleep test. You get a, a device made by Keller. Uh, we have really good reviews for these, and it's just great for, for new dentists doing this. It's great for team members. Uh, it, it's, uh, we, we, uh, we really enjoy doing them. We're doing one at the Keller Lab in, in St. Louis in February, uh, as well as uh, Rich's uh, how San Antonio in February, Rich? Is it hit or miss? Or is it uh, what, what's the temperature no, like there? You know, January is kind of our worst month, uh, uh -huh. but uh, by February, you know, we're back in shorts here as well. So uh, we got the Great River Walk in San Antonio. So you now these are all great. Uh, and we're adding. <laughs> and we're adding uh, several other ones that are uh, just haven't been finalized yet. So keep keep in contact with us too, as a uh, as where these courses are. They're they're really implementation courses. They're not just a bunch of about sleep staging and so forth. They're they're how you do this, how we do this in our practice. Here's how we do it from device selection to to billing to to verbal skills and and how we get going. So. Uh, we also have another uh, webinar coming up after the first of the year uh, with the with Keller uh, webinar series, and we're going to talk about which devices that we use and where we use them, and indications and contraindications for dental devices. So that's always a really uh, good uh, webinar as well. Uh, thanks again to Keller. If you haven't seen their Clear Dream. Uh, 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 dorsal device it is really one of the nicest ones out there it's a great price point too so uh, uh, just talk to them they'll be happy to share with you about it and uh, again it's a great device